Very good afternoon to His Excellency, Mr. Will Nankivis, Australian Ambassador to ASEAN, our distinguished speakers and all our participants. Thank you for joining us in this special episode of ESI, a webinar where we will be looking at social enterprises and disability, fostering innovation, awareness, as well as social impact in the ASEAN region. You know, social enterprises have emerged as key factors for developing new, innovative, as well as scalable forms of support for persons with disabilities. And um, social entrepreneurship is also a growing phenomenon, both worldwide and across the region. And social enterprises are uniquely positioned to provide solutions to some of the challenges facing persons with disabilities today, including effective responses to the significant issue of unequal employment. To that end, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, or ERIA, has recently released a research project report authored by Impact 46, a social impact accelerator. This study aims to analyze the role of social enterprises as key actors to foster innovation, awareness, and inclusion for persons with disabilities in the ASEAN region. It brings together the perspectives of various social enterprises across the ASEAN region. So we are therefore delighted this afternoon to you know, present to you key elements and outcomes of this research, and then followed by a panel discussion with our distinguished speakers. To start us off this afternoon, it is my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Will Nankervis, Australian Ambassador to ASEAN, to give the opening remarks. Your Excellency, please. Thanks very much, TJ. And it's really great to be here with you all, albeit virtually, of course. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Australian government has a really steadfast and ongoing commitment to promoting gender equality, disability inclusiveness, and social inclusion through its foreign policy. An estimated 1 billion people around the world live with a disability. That amounts to approximately 15% of the global population. In the ASEAN region, that works out at around 100 million people. And where I'm speaking from in Australia, the proportion is similar. Approximately 18% of Australians have disabilities or around that, and that's around 4.4 million people. So the global COVID-19 pandemic has thrown up new challenges for governments and societies seeking to protect and improve the rights of persons with disabilities, including in this region. On multiple fronts, from access to basic services such as education and healthcare to decent employment opportunities, the pandemic has had a profound impact, particularly acute for persons with disabilities. The impact on mental health arising from the pandemic has been particularly concerning to us all, and an issue strongly taken up by Brunei as 2021 ASEAN Chair. ASEAN's commitment to building back better from the pandemic, encapsulated in its COVID comprehensive COVID recovery framework is admirable. The framework commits ASEAN to an economic recovery from the pandemic that's inclusive and takes into account the complex intersection of disability, age and gender. It's also in line with the emphasis in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific on promoting inclusiveness and a greater sense of community across all aspects of ASEAN activity. Australia, ASEAN's first dialogue partner and now a comprehensive strategic partner is fully committed to supporting ASEAN implement its recovery agenda. To best achieve this, we would suggest that ASEAN and its partners actively include persons with disabilities in the design and implementation of recovery initiatives to best ensure that these initiatives benefit the community and don't inadvertently exclude persons with disabilities or worsen discrimination or disadvantage already being experienced. Australia's Development for All strategy aims to promote improved quality of life of persons with disabilities in developing countries. In our region, this is exemplified by Australia's Disability Rights in ASEAN program. Through this initiative, Australia is providing support for the implementation of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025, 
mainstreaming the rights of persons with disabilities. Our program supports a leading role for persons with disabilities in the design and implementation of the Enabling Master Plan 2025. Again, it's from within the community that we can best source the expertise and ideas for effective interventions. We continue to advocate for the Enabling Master Plan's implementation across ASEAN communities, including through strengthening relationships with ASEAN sectoral bodies to engage with civil society and disability advocates. Australia is committed to advancing this important agenda through strong partnerships with ASEAN networks and organisations representing persons with disabilities and through ongoing engagement with the Australian Human Rights Commission. I'd like to thank AREA for hosting today's event, which Australia is really pleased to be supporting and, and which I'm, I'm very uh, pleased and honoured to be providing some remarks for. I acknowledge in particular the work of Juliana Ejmoni Marsan, Area Strategies and Partnerships Director, and the entire team involved in the study. Australia strongly endorses and encouraging the growing, growing emphasis Area is placing on mainstreaming gender, disability, and social inclusion in its economic research and outreach. These aren't niche, niche issues. They're essential to ensuring our region's recovery from the global pandemic is shared equitably by all. Taking this vital work forward is of course, not just the work of governments and academics. Civil society and the private sector play a key role, including in supporting disability inclusion and ensuring better employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. As the study we're launching today shows, social enterprises are leading the way in developing new innov innovative and scalable forms of support for persons with disabilities. The study makes a number of recommendations for how ASEAN and its member states can better harness the potential of social enterprises to achieve positive impact for disability rights in our region. I commend the authors for this important work and look forward to seeing many of its recommendations taken up by policymakers. I'll end with a word of congratulations and encouragement to representatives of ASEAN social enterprises online with us today. Your work is making an impact, including on the tens of millions of persons with disabilities in our region right now. On behalf of Australia, I wish you great success in your endeavours and for everyone a productive discussion today. Thanks again for the opportunity and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your thoughts. Um, as His Excellency has another appointment, he will have to take his leave, uh, but we would like to thank you once again for joining us this afternoon. I would now like to introduce um, our first two speakers, Mr. Nicola Costa and Ms. Alison Sandis, who will be sharing with us the outcomes of the research report on social enterprises and disability. Nicola is one of the world's leading experts on impact investment, philanthropy, and nonprofit management. He has an extensive experience among a wide range of impact-driven organizations. In the UN and the OECD, he held senior management positions um, for a total of almost 18 years. And at the United Nations in New York, Nicola played a key role in helping to define the global sustainable development goals or the SDGs that we're familiar with. You know, in Epic Foundation, as the executive vice president and board member, he helped to build one of the most innovative philanthropic foundations from the ground up. And at Epic, Nicola oversaw one of the largest NGO and donor surveys ever performed globally and the development of cutting edge nonprofit due diligence and social impact monitoring methodologies. He is the founder of Bandic, an award-winning social enterprise that provides access to services to thousands of migrant kids across Southeast Asia. In recent years, Bandek has become a strategic implementing partner of UNICEF and won the MIT Award for Social Innovation in 2017. He is also an author and a lecturer. You know, his articles and books on social impact, development, economics, and philanthropy has been extensively translated and published globally. He has been a visiting lecturer on social impact and innovation at MIT, Sciences Po, and Hong Kong University. Nicola directly oversees support to every client over at I-46. Now, depending on the nature and scope of the task, he will select a team 
from some of the finest, most experienced social impact practitioners globally. And these world-class professionals represent diverse areas of expertise, ensuring impact among any sector or geographic scope. So we're happy to have you with us this afternoon, Nicola. Let me quickly introduce um, Alison, because I'm sure you want to listen to the outcomes of the presentation. Alison is the Director of Impact and Development at Impact Voice 6, where she leverages experience in the academic and nonprofit sectors to conduct action research and provide operational support to foundations, nonprofits, and social enterprises. Alison previously served as the Director of Strategy and Partnerships for Bandit Foundation, a Thai NGO, uh, which I shared earlier, whose mission is really to provide health, education, and protection support to vulnerable children. Prior to her work with international NGOs, Alison worked with the Native American tribes on behalf of the University of Colorado in the US. Her strategic, operational, and academic skills have contributed to diverse communities internationally. You know, we are so pleased to have both of them with us this afternoon. And I will hand the time over to Alison and Nicola to share with us the outcome of this research report. Over to you. Thank you, TJ. So I have the pleasure of presenting many of our findings, um, which I'll hand over to Nicola in a moment as well. Um, our report itself is a review of disability inclusion throughout ASEAN today. And more than um, simply this review of what is taking place today, it's also a look into solutions that are emerging from social entrepreneurs. Some of these social entrepreneurs are, of course, a, card of, a part of our call today, and we'll get to hear from them directly during the roundtable discussion in just a moment. And in the meantime, we get to set the stage for understanding much better the issue of persons with disabilities, as well as the opportunities for social enterprises throughout ASEAN today. Um, so a few notes on the context for this study overall. Um, as the ambassador shared in part, it's estimated that one in every six people live with a disability in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and of course, disability in this context refers to any type of intellectual, mental, or physical disability. Um, and of course, with such um, a significant population, boosting the social and and, and I would like to add the word full here, boosting the full social and economic inclusion of this population represents cru crucial opportunities for societies. Um, and I believe as most of us on this call are aware today, social enterprises themselves are businesses focusing on social benefits in addition to financial benefits. So these are the types of twofold organizations that essentially provide both the social services of nonprofits, as well as the business revenues of companies. Social enterprises themselves are of course, a recent and very rapidly growing phenomenon across the ASEAN region. And um, within uh, this particular study on, uh, social, on disability uh, throughout the ASEAN region, social enterprises in particular have emerged as key actors who are capable of developing innovative and scalable solutions to promoting the full inclusion of persons with disability throughout the region. And fortunately, we get to see a number of uh, very exciting and compelling examples of those social enterprises throughout our discussion today. Um, and it's also worth adding, um, as you'll see throughout this presentation as well, that many of these social enterprises are led by young social entrepreneurs themselves and many of these young social entrepreneurs are themselves persons with disabilities. Um, this is a very interesting trend um, in parts of the, the innovative approaches um, to doing business that we'll learn about more throughout the discussions today. And um, as I move through some of the key findings of our report, um, there, there are really five very topmost key messages that we're interested to share with everyone today. Starting with, of course, number one, 
disability inclusive employment represents a great social and economic opportunity for post pandemic recovery. The ambassador addressed this a bit in his opening remarks as well. We truly have a very unique opportunity at the moment to reevaluate many of the frameworks that are in place today. So of course, like many other vulnerable groups, persons with disabilities have been disproportionately affected by the COVID pandemic. Um, and throughout the pandemic, persons with disabilities, um, this form of um, vulnerability that they've experienced is mainly increased difficulties in accessing public services such as health, education, and other support services. Um, however, they have been uh, significantly impacted in, in many other ways as well, um, which I'm sure we'll, um, we'll be able to address more uh, throughout our panel discussion in a moment as well. Um, and it's also worth adding here that persons with disabilities still continue to face barriers to accessing these services, which may lead to worsened dis discrimination against persons with disabilities themselves, such as employment discrimination in particular. You'll hear this topic mentioned a lot throughout our conversations today, as employment discrimination in particular is, is one of the most rampant uh, or pervasive challenges facing persons with disabilities throughout ASEAN today. Um, and uh, lastly, on this particular finding, um, studies show, of course, that the GDP of Asia Pacific countries could rise by one to 7% overall if we're able to provide disability inclusive employment sectors. Um, and of course, we add this economic figure, which is so important. And then um, it, it goes without saying that the, the social inclusion um, cannot be quantified in the same way as um, the, the also very critical economic inclusion for this population. And um, our second key takeaway from this report is that social enterprises have emerged as key actors for identifying new solutions and fostering the inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities. So truly the, the key message of all of our conversations today and the main finding of our, of our report overall, of course, social entrepreneurship is itself a growing phenomenon, both worldwide and within ASEAN. And in fact, according to the UNSCAP and the British Council, up to 1 million social enterprises are tackling social and environmental problems across Southeast Asia today. And in many ASEAN countries, social entrepreneurship has built upon the evolving history of cooperatives and shown significant growth in recent years. Um, and this is quite unique, of course, for the Asian region that there's already such a rich cooperative history to be built upon. And uh, so many of these social enterprises are, are founded and established so recently. For example, in Singapore, over 90% of existing social enterprises have been established only since 2010. Again, that's over 90% of the existing social enterprises. And about 67% of these have been operational for less than five years. Um, so it's truly a growing trend increasingly. Um, and even in Indonesia, over 70% of social enterprises have been established in the past five years. Um, and lastly, the rise of, of social enterprises in the region reflects both the need for social innovation and the growing demand for purpose-driven enterprises, especially amongst millennial consumers. According to the World Economic Forum, 40% of millennials report that they believe the goal, that they believe that the goal of business should be to improve society. Millennials make up 40% of all consumers today, influencing about 40 billion US dollars in sales worldwide. And um, our next truly key takeaway from the study overall um, is this very interesting trend that most of social enterprises are led by young social entrepreneurs, many of whom are persons with disabilities themselves. Um, so trends in entrepreneurship worldwide have shown the growing emergence of young leaders, which is true in the ASEAN region as well. And of course, persons with disabilities have considerable assets to leverage in advocating for disability rights, in particular, their own firsthand knowledge of their needs and the ability to develop effective solutions to social problems. Um, so 
Um, I believe it's it's really these trends um, as well as this point on self advocacy that um, help reinforce how extremely well positioned these social enterprises truly are for addressing inclusion throughout ASEAN. And um, I'd actually like to share a quote from the founder and president of Virtue Alahan, one of our participating social entrepreneurs um, who wasn't able to join us today. This quote from Ryan um, during one of our discussions for this report, he shared, we are now beyond the good for business case that it's good for companies to hire people with disabilities. True inclusion is when you build mechanisms for persons with disabilities and everyone to thrive, including in the workplace. And of course, social enterprises have emerged as key actors for their capacity to identify new solutions in situations where there may be inadequate policy protection, as well as private sector inaction. And an increasing number of social enterprises are offering vocational skills and recruitment support for private companies to foster disability inclusion. Um, so again, as we mentioned earlier, um, the very important topic of employment discrimination. Employment discrimination is being significantly addressed and increasingly addressed by these social enterprises today. And in fact, the majority of social enterprises supporting persons with disabilities in ASEAN have one or more of the following objectives, to provide education, skills, or training to persons with disabilities, to create jobs and provide direct employment for persons with disabilities, and to support the employment or job placement of persons with disabilities with external company and organization partners. Of course, there are a number of social enterprises supporting persons with disabilities, addressing other areas as well. Um, but it's really this um, main topic of employment discrimination that, that is increasingly represented today. Um, and of course, um, in the, I'll, I'll share a couple of examples that we'll get to hear about much more in a moment. Um, so in the technology sector in particular, there are many social enterprises who train persons with disabilities in tech skills, which of course increase the individual's employability as well as their potential for higher and earning income. And in the hospitality industry, many social enterprises train persons with disabilities in the skills needed to work in high performing restaurants, coffee shops, bakeries, and a wide variety of other companies. And um, as a segue um, to Nicola's conclusion of our study, I can add here that governments across ASEAN could significantly help advance social entrepreneurship that supports persons with disabilities. Um, one of the key findings, of course, is the importance of policy support, um, not only for implementing the Convention on the Rights uh, for Persons with Disabilities, but also for supporting the actual structure and establishment of social entrepreneurship throughout the ASEAN region as well. And with that being said, I'll go ahead and pass on our concluding recommendations to Nicola. Thank you. Um, so as explained, uh, I, I believe very clearly by, um, by Alison, um, the uh, contribution of social enterprises in supporting people with disability in the region is, is significant and the potential contribution is even higher. But uh, what our analysis, I believe has shown very clearly is that these potential cannot be realized if social enterprises in the region are not uh, adequately supported by a, 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 a conducive ecosystem. So the report uh, puts forward uh, recommendations for basically for five, um, categories of actors that, that could and should do more to support social enterprises in the region. So first and foremost, uh, as mentioned already, uh, governments uh, that uh, of course, as explained in, in detail in the report, um, can do more uh, to strengthen the national regulatory frameworks uh, related to both social enterprises. So the way uh, social enterprises are, are defined and treated and the disability rights. Second, also obviously corporations, as we know, can do a lot to advance disability rights and inclusion, uh, basically by promoting the equal uh, employment and pay of persons with disabilities. The third category perhaps is one that we don't discuss enough, uh, usually foundations and uh, philanthropists. Um, 
we found that um, from an analysis of basically what foundations in the ASEAN region support, that uh, disability is, is pretty much neglected uh, as a topic. So uh, it is clear that foundations and philanthropists uh, could do more in terms of providing strategic uh, grants, strategic support to social enterprises in the region, uh, working on this topic. Um, the fourth category, very important, in, in my opinion, uh, we all know that we live the years of the rise of uh, finance that is labeled as responsible or sustainable or ESG. Uh, so we are talking about uh, immense resources. So uh, we believe that uh, these, or at least part of this investment capital could uh, be uh, very, very useful to support uh, social enterprises and needs to focus a bit more on the topic of disability. And then perhaps last but not least, um, social enterprises themselves. Uh, we found that, um, um, and this is certainly not the case with those that are with us today, that our organizations are extremely robust and well-structured. We found that many social enterprises working in this, case, in this uh, field are, are not particularly uh, well-structured. And, uh, and in particular, they often struggle to quantify and to demonstrate their impact. So there is a bit of homework, of course, to do also on the side of the social enterprises themselves to get ready for these other actors to then uh, support them. So uh, these are uh, obviously these points are developed uh, more in details in the report. And I would like to just conclude um, by saying that um, it has been an incredible uh, learning journey. Uh, and we would like to thank um, the social enterprises that uh, are doing a fantastic job every day. Uh, on this uh, topic in this region and from, uh, uh, and from these organizations, we have uh, learned a lot. And so we're particularly grateful to, to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison and Nicola for sharing the outcomes of the report. Uh, but more importantly, I think the recommendations that have come out from it. Um, for our participants this afternoon, if you have any questions, you know, either for uh, Nicola, Alison or for our panelists later, I would like to invite you to please key in your questions into the Q&A chat box. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A chat box that you can use to key in your questions so that during the Q&A segment, we can address them as much as we can. Now, let me introduce our four panelists for this afternoon. You know, I want to share with you a little bit more about them before we go into a conversation with each one of them. Um, our first panelist is Max Simpson, founder and CEO of Steps with Thera, based in Thailand. Max has been working with the neurodivergent community for over 15 years. And the longer they have worked alongside this community, the more evidence they have that they are value adding you know, employees to any business. Max has successfully modeled 11 inclusive and sustainable social businesses, including coffee shops, bakeries, eco shops, and even a business service center. Max believes strongly in demonstrating the sustainability of inclusive businesses to change the narrative around disability and to empower the business community to replicate these models. In 2019, Max was listed as one of the top 50 young leaders shaping Asia's future. Um, Steps was also honored with the International Provision of the Year Award by the prestigious National Association for Special Education Needs, or NASEN, based in the United Kingdom. Max also sits on the board of the Special Education Network and Inclusion Association. There is a global need for change in employment outcomes. And Max founded Steps in 2016 to meet that need. You know, we're so happy to have you, us, uh, have you with us this afternoon. Let me move on to our second panelist. Um, Stop Me On is the country director for Epic Arts Cambodia. Stop Me is an experienced advocate for inclusion in wider society and in the arts and culture sector who has been a pioneer for inclusion in the arts throughout her 14 years career at Epic Arts. In 2015, she was recognized as one of CLA's 
five living arts fellows, cultural leadership and sustainability in society. The following year, Sokni spent 10 weeks in the UK working with Unlimited at the inter as the International uh, Professional Development Placement Assistant Producer, you know, looking into arts at Min, looking into shape arts. And in 2017, she was selected to join the US Department of State International Visitor Leadership Program to look at promoting social change through the arts. Now in 2020, she was selected to join an online training organized by the KOICA and CAIT, hosted by Kyonghi University in Korea, really looking at you know, um, capacity building programs for civil society leaders, um, looking into the UN SDGs in developing countries. And this year, you know, so every year she has been, you know, in, in, been part of something that has really just been great. This year, she was selected to join UNESCO's um, training on a creative economy in partnership with City University of London. Sokni is a board member of a few local organizations, such as the Cambodian Living Arts, Cooperation Committee for Cambodia, Chom Kriel Language School, a Working Group Inclusion, Education and Disability, and also an advisor at the Ministry of Fine Arts. Thank you for joining us. You know, our next uh, panelist is Mr. Ko Seng Chun. He's the Executive Director for Project Dignity in Singapore. Um, he founded Project Dignity both in Singapore as well as Hong Kong. And prior to setting up this social enterprise, he assisted companies to develop business in India and China. Um, and on a part-time basis, he lectures in the SP Giant Center of Management. Project Dignity is a social enterprise and comprises Dignity Kitchen Singapore, Dignity Kitchen Hong Kong, and Dignity Mama Singapore, located in four major hospitals. The social mission is to return dignity to the disabled and disadvantaged through vocation with passion. The vocation relates to hawker trade and culinary skills. The disabled include physical, mental, social, and intellectual. Um, they have trained and placed over 2,000 persons with disabilities and treated more than 100,000 elderly to free meals over the, few, over the years that the enterprise has been established. Thank you, uh, Seng Chun, for joining us this afternoon. And our final panelist is Ms. Victoria Morris, Chief Executive Officer of Alina Vision in Vietnam. Um, Victoria, you know, she, in, this, in this social enterprise that she has uh, set up, she works to establish and operate eye hospitals and vision centers in the undeserved markets. She came to Elena after almost a decade in the international development sector, where she provided strategic advice and in-house executive leadership to global organizations, including Care Australia and the Fred Hollows Foundation. Victoria has um, experience, deep experience you know, in startup enterprises, having built and strengthened businesses across Asia, Africa, and Australia. She started her career in the private sector, analyzing and advising financial services businesses. So thank you, Victoria, and our four panelists, our three other panelists, you know, for taking time out from your busy schedules to join us in conversation this afternoon. So I want to just dive right away, you know, to our conversation uh, by asking all our panelists this first question. You know, against the backdrop of this study that you were involved in, please share with us your enterprise's vision, the unique features, you know, whether it's the innovation part or the scalable aspects, and most importantly, how it has positively impacted persons with disabilities. Max, if I could have you to start the ball rolling, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, TJ. Pleasure to be here. Um, so STEPS works to create an inclusive society with a, a focus on employment equity. We, we do all of the three things that Alison outlined um, in their findings. So we are 
both providing uh, accessible and appropriate accredited training to the neurodivergent community. Um, we are modeling a range of sustainable and inclusive businesses, and we are working with uh, employers to hand over that knowledge and enable them to become inclusive uh, employers. Uh, and in addition to that, our own inclusive sustainable businesses provide employment opportunities for our uh, trainees and our graduates. It's very important for us that we model this and that it remains sustainable. Um, this is something that is no easy task, but it's something that we've managed to do and do rather well over the past five years. Um, and partnering with those organizations is a key part for us. So larger employers who have an appetite to uh, operate these businesses and grow them once we prove the concept is an area that we're now emerging into and has proven quite successful. This builds trust for the business community uh, who then support, we then support to champion inclusion themselves to other organizations, which is where we see the, the, the larger change. Um, in terms of the positive impact for the, the neurodivergent community, 100% um, of our graduates move on to either sustainable paid employment or further education, um, having attained the skills and most importantly, the self-confidence and the self-esteem to do so. Um, so the immediate positive impact we see is that they are then accepted um, for who they are and not asked to adapt or change their uh, behaviors uh, and taught to value themselves, uh, which then enables them to go on and be the value adding employees that we, we know they can be. Uh, the longer term impact comes from the employers and the wider society valuing the neurodivergent attributes that we're talking about uh, and learning how to create inclusive workplaces themselves. Thank you very much, Max. Um, you know, I, I really like what you shared about you know um, them being accepted for who they are. I think that is so important. Um, you know, stop me if I may move on to you. You know, um, I would like to pose the same question to you, and if you could share it, your thoughts with us, please. Thank you, TJ's. Yes, very similar. That's really nice to hear from our friend from Steps. Uh, Epic Art is uh, our work is to promote a quality and celebrity diversity with people with all ability. So our work is uh, it's inclusion. It means we work more uh, with people with disability, but also with people without disability because we believe that when uh, they go back to the community, they have to live with their own community. That's why we set the path, uh, the bridge between the, them and their own community. And uh, we, uh, on the ground in Cambodia, we do three programs. We have inclusive education program, which is uh, empowering and provide education for them to be uh, living independently and uh, learn the new skill for them to be able to get a new job and be independent, uh, not based uh, or based or uh, need support from the family all the time, that part of our education. Also, we have a community program that responds to the need of people with uh, disability in our community. So the community program is a uh, different place program like a uh, performance, uh, raising awareness performances, and also uh, finding people with disability because in Cambodia, uh, the database of the people with disability is still lacked. So we have to go house by house, uh, community by community, find them to be able to join to our program in big, back in Kampot, Cambodia. And the third program today that we will uh, focus on is social enterprise, which is we have um, an, an epic art cafe in Kampot run by uh, people with disability. 70% of them are person with disability. And also we have a creation shop that produced by our student part of our education program. Also, we have our encounter performance, which is the performance groups uh, by a person with disability. They are traveling around the world in Cambodia, also uh, nationalities, international as well, to uh, perform. The, their performance is about race awareness for people with disability. Also, the uh, talk about social issue in Cambodia, because we feel that we live in our community is our responsible for social inclusion in where we're living. Um, throughout those programs, we're providing uh, skills, knowledge, experience, and self-confidence, like uh, our friend talked about. Self-confidence is very important because uh, 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 what our work here, we very work on with the graph group, people with disability, they don't have skill or confidence. 
that we provide them. So that will be with them forever because that's very important for the soft skills for them. Um, also, we providing a space and resource for uh, resource and space and um, skill for them to explore what they what they really want to be, because that's the first time for us myself, person with disability, uh, for the first time we don't even know what we want to be because we, that's not a toy for us to have as a person with disability. And also we provide an uh, inclusive environment of working place like at a cafe that for people with disability work in a cafe and creation of as well as in uh, where we uh, have uh, Epic Arts have over 45 staff, 70% uh, of staff are people with disability and they work with different uh, area like some of them administrative, some of them artists, performers, some of them uh, leaders, some of them finance. So that's really good for uh, the, the floor for them to explore where they want to be. And also we provide the access for that as well, not just a working place without providing access for them. Um, also uh, uh, through the workplace and job providing for them, it's actually hard to decrease discrimination in the community. And also within their own family, because they have a financial independent, they don't, independ they don't depend on their family anymore. That, uh, uh, in that, they can make their own decision by uh, choosing what they want to be and living their own life. So they have joy and freedom to live their own life, which is very important for us. That a big success for us because we want to change life, not about the number, but about the quality of uh, life of a person with disability. And then uh, at the end is uh, them also as a role model to raise awareness of social inclusion. And yet they also uh, participate with Epic Art to raise uh, funding for support the program where we run back here at uh, Epic Art Center. That's all we have from Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. No, thank you so much for sharing. Let me move on to Sing Chun in Singapore. You know, same question to you as well, Sing Chun. You know, please share a bit more with us. Okay, first of all, thank you, Alison, and thanks you guys for inviting us. Uh, I do apologize because I'm in the middle, if there's music disturbance, I'm in the middle of my son's wedding rehearsal. I got the two o'clock and the three o'clock all screw up. So <laughs> I thought Singapore is a two o'clock thing. So I do apologize. Okay, Project Dignity was started about 10, 15 years ago. The idea is very simple, to give the dignity to the disabled and disadvantaged through vocation. So it's based on four basic principles aligned to what Alison just presented earlier. First, in order to give them dignity, you must give them the skill. Don't give them the fish, teach them how to fish. And to do that, I started something called a hawker training center. Now, you go to any ASEAN country, the first person you see is the guy selling on the street, roadside selling hawker food, correct? But do you know there's no training center for hawkers anywhere in the world? Because people, when they open a culinary school, they want to earn money. Nobody ever thought of earning money from hawkers. But now, hawker is UNESCO side. So the sec first thing I must skill, and to skill them, I need to write the curriculum. I spent two years writing the entire curriculum for how to run a hawker store. Then after that, I got the Singapore government approval. This is the intellectual property. After scaling them, step two, create job for them because we are job creator. Once a person has a job, he has a living, he got his life. So the idea now is to create jobs. I don't know whether you hear me, the music is bad, blasting at the back. So create job for them. If I cannot create job, that means I place you in uh, different cafes, hawker center. If I cannot create job, I create businesses. So the first one I create was Dignity Mama. Now, we are solving problems. When a mother gives birth to a child with disability, everybody focus on the child. Wrong. You focus on the mother. You see, as a woman, the relationship with the child will never be broken. Some of them, even the husband run away. Right. Father-in-law, why you ask give you a kid who is disabled? So the mother suffer a lot of depression, whatever it is, and they always have to stick with the child. So what we do, this project is to open a second-hand bookshop selling second-hand books. Now, this is also environmentally friendly. You guys all got books at home, right? Your Harry Potter, you throw away. Don't. You give it to me and I sell for $2, $3. I make the money. At the same time, I'm creating job for our mother and child. By the way, they're all paid, right? So I got five to hospital now, number six is coming up, where mother and child working together. And I tell you, the transformation of mother is fantastic. When they first started, they looked very tired. 
Now they make up, they go for afternoon tea with the other. It's, it's a real fantastic transformation. After that, another project I have is Dignity AI. AI. This is called impossible. Why? I'm trying to create jobs for people who are home power paralytic. How do you create jobs? Thanks to James Cameron, I got an idea for Avatar. You know, you don't show the Avatar, right? The guy paralyzed, he goes around. So the same idea, why don't we use robot? And the idea of the robot, come on, you guys have robot spraying sanitizer. Robot are about smarter than that. And you use robot with a funny looking cartoon face. Why not bring a disabled person to run the robot? Now it's operating in Dignity Kitchen, Singapore, Dignity Hong Kong uh, as receptionist. It's now running at higher regency Sati in Hong Kong as a concierge. So we check up, the robot will go to you, tell you where you're from, how are you today? Then in Singapore, it's going to start in hospital in January, in Kempong Hospital, because as reception and robots are fantastic. But the person is far, far away at home operating a robot. And by the way, this will only work because of 5G and Android. I know, I designed the program. Don't buy iPhone. iPhone is crap. They can't even download any app. Android is very good. Seriously, it doesn't have to pay anything. <laughs> Sorry, but I know you guys carry iPhone. The, third, the fourth project is Dignity Farm. The world is talking about urban farm, correct? Where are the farmers? And if you work with autistic children, they're fantastic. I got two operating my farm now. It's a small farm. And I tell you, 8 o'clock water the plant, 9 o'clock weeding. They know. They just standardize the whole thing. And they, are, they can take. They love because they can see the plant growing, you know? And that is what's so very remarkable. Then we have a con we have started a digital kitchenette for mental patient, right? So all these jobs create over a lot of jobs. The third principle is to integrate back to society. And by the way, everywhere you go in ASEAN, hawker center, food court, everything is an integration center. Everybody needs to eat. That's all. Right. And by the way, food court and hawker center cater to the masses. And the fourth principle is inclusion, getting society to extract them. And what I did is I go, it's quite, quite interesting now. I, what I do is I go to nursing home. You know, a lot of people go to nursing home to, enter, to, to entertain the elderly. Don't. Bring them out. So what I did is I bring elderly out and I give them a city tour and come to Dignity Kitchen. Then I get corporate to come in. I get students to come in. You get the bait to catch the fish. Right. Everybody loves to entertain elderly. So in a place like Dignity Kitchen, it's a complete ecosystem. You've got the disabled people cooking, the elderly eating, and corporate pay. So the four basic fatal handle people are physical, mental, social, intellectual, all in one go. Youngest is 17, oldest is 87. We take on people who are terminal illness. You know that they didn't die one year. They survived five years, six years. So as of today, we train and place over 2,000 Singaporeans. Right. In Hong Kong, it's about 89 people so far. Right. Uh, in terms of elderly coming for lunch, we've done over 260,000. Every single year, we've done that. Because when I grow old, I hope you guys, young one, bring me up for a holiday or something like that. Right. That's what it's all about. So, by the way, it's a profitable business. It sustained itself even last year at COVID-19. We earn money not by one revenue. We sell food. We own delivery. We organize events. We train people. And all this graduate a million-dollar business so far. Of a $3 million business within Hong Kong and China. So, basically, we are job creator for people with differently able people. That's all. Good story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <laughs> Sing Chun. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we shall not dwell on the mobile phones uh, at this point in time. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, thank you for sharing with us. And I, I like this thought that you had about transformation. You know, even as you skill them, you give them the confidence, you are transforming them yeah, so that they can be accepted where they are. We see the hotel as well. No, no, this is the Let, wedding procession now. They are walking ah, in now. Okay. <laughs> Let me move on quickly to Victoria. Uh, Victoria, please do share with us your thoughts as well. Thanks, TJ. Um, so I'm CEO of Alina Vision. So Alina's mission is to develop a network of sustainable eye centres in underserved markets. Um, and we, we provide high quality eye services to um, people across the income spectrum. Um, so this includes things like cataract surgery, um, eye checks, 
um, glasses. We and we also um, check people and treat um, blindness or vision loss that's resulting from diabetes, which is obviously a growing issue. Um, the second part of our mission is around training. So we also support the professional development of um, eye care personnel um, to make make our staff eye, lead, eye care leaders in, in underserved markets as well. So our first hospital is in, is in Vietnam, um, just outside of Hanoi in a place called Hung Yen province. Um, and I'm really hoping to get there at some point soon. Um, I guess I would say Alina's unique features, there's three parts of our social enterprise. Um, the first one is quality. So in Vietnam, um, the outcome when you go for cataract surgery is sometimes not great. Um, and that fills people um, with a little bit of fear about whether they should seek treatment. So um, Alina's surgical outcomes are about 20 percentage points higher than the Vietnam market average. Um, and we're also consistently above the WHO benchmark as well. So we've set up some, some solid clinical protocols and we have a really rigorous um, clinical monitoring system but also our training in-house enables us as well to deliver those outcomes and, and means that more people will seek, seek services. Um, I think the second part is, is around cross subsidization um, So we operate a tiered pricing model, which means that um, all patients get the same high quality care. Uh, it's just they choose a package that they can afford. Um, so we undertake significant outreach programs into the community um, and work with government as well to, to reach um, and provide access to many, many people. Um, and, and as of a few months ago, uh, about more than half of our patients receive treatment free or, or at a low cost. Um, and the third feature I'd say, as I mentioned before, is training. So um, in Vietnam, only about a third of ophthalmologists are actually able to do surgery. Um, and cataracts are the uh, cause 75% of blindness. So, so that's a lot of cataracts that aren't being operated on. So um, our model is really focused on building uh, the different cadres of eye health personnel, including surgeons um, who can not only do surgery, but do surgery at a really high quality, um, again, to give patients confidence of their outcomes. Um, so I think that these, these three features all together really mean that anyone can get high quality eye care um, in Vietnam, and, and we're hoping to expand out of um, Hanoi and into other parts of Vietnam, as well as um, into the broader Asia region shortly. So um, just a few sort of figures to finish for me. Um, so far, we've been operating for a couple of years. We started just as COVID ramped up, um, but we have screened about 53,000 patients for um, eye checks. And we've done about 4,000 cataract and other surgeries. So 20% of those have been free. Um, and we've also trained two surgeons, um, three other medical ophthalmologists and, and also 21 nurses. So um, I think Alina delivers um, on health outcomes, but also obviously addressing blindness and vision impairment also helps with economic um, and socio-cultural outcomes and educational outcomes as well. Thanks, TJ. Thank you, Victoria. Um, you know, it's, it's good, not good, let me rephrase that. It is really great sharing, you know, even for a first round of conversation from our speakers. Um, for our participants, I really want to encourage you, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to put it into the Q&A chat box. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the speakers, I believe most, if not all of them, are already on LinkedIn. You know, um, please feel free to search for them, connect with them. You know, the need is real, um, but it does require people to step up in partnership to meet those needs. Let me move on then to, you know, just, just to move our conversation a bit deeper. Um, I guess for all our speakers, I'm sure you have all faced challenges along this journey. But as an entrepreneur myself, I also believe that very often these challenges bring about opportunities for change, opportunities for growth. So 
if I could have you share some of the challenges you faced, and I think more importantly, the opportunities that arose out of them. And finally, the changes that you hope to make within this sphere of society. You know, for, for this second round, if I could ask Victoria to, perhaps if you could share your thoughts first, please. Sure. Um... I've, there's definitely lots of challenges over the last couple of years, um, like everybody. I, I guess I'll just pick one, which is that um, COVID in Vietnam, um, the government took an approach quite similar to Australia, actually, which is um, hard lockdown. And um, hard lockdown meant that we couldn't do much outreach um, into communities during, during that time um, when COVID was, was really bad. So we had to... Um, look at a different way to reach patients. Um, as a new brand in the market, we, um, we had to sort of get creative. So it did, TJ's right, it did um, present some opportunities for us. Um, and I guess there's, there was two positives that, that came out of, of that. One was that um, we had to accelerate our investment and work around getting our brand and profile out there in, in our local area and do that work to get more um, walk-in patients in. So um, that was something we'd always planned to do, but it was, it accelerated that. And that channel provides more profit um, for us, obviously. Um, so that means we can probably get closer to sustainability quicker and then reinvest those profits um, for more free or low cost treatments for patients. So, so that was the first positive. Um, I think the second sort of opportunity was because we couldn't take the team out into the community to do screening, we had to bring the community um, in to the hospital. So that meant transporting lots of people in to do screening at the hospital, um, which is a little bit expensive, um, but it did offer a great opportunity for, for many, many people to experience what our hospital looks like um, and to feel confident that they would have quality services and then could go back to their community and, and be advocates for us. Um, so uh, this also enabled us to keep our volumes up over COVID, which also meant that our trainees could keep their training going because they need a certain number of volumes of experience in order to get certified. So um, I think they were the two opportunities that came out of something that was um, initially quite stressing on our business model. Um, and, and in terms of TJ's last point around sort of the changes we hope to make within this sphere, um, for us, our Vietnam hospital is the first hospital um, and it's progressing well, but we hope to um, expand our footprint and, and really ramp up our impact um, with, with more people being screened and treated. Um, we hope soon to be self-financing and, and can therefore then self-fund our growth as well, but um, I guess our, our very, very immediate priority is around really proving our business model and then seeking further funding, including attracting in new funding to eye health and new funding to impact, particularly from the private sector, um, to help support our objectives of, of ending avoidable blindness and vision impairment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, Sing Chun has to take his leave, so he sends his apologies for, to all of us. So I'd like to move on to Sokni. You know, um, same question to you, because it's a different country. I think the context is also different. Please, please do share with us your thoughts. Thank you, TJ. Yes, um, if you talk about a challenging, we are have similar, um, but uh, uh, most of the quite stressed out for people with disability in Cambodia is accessibility. It's quite a huge challenging for us, which is I'm talking about not just access to the physical place, but uh, access to education, access to information, access to uh, uh, you know social business or working place. That's really difficult. So that very caused a lot of problem with uh, uh, people with disability in Cambodian society, especially when we talk about access to education. And then it means people with disability not really uh, be able to study a higher education, then they difficult to get a job that really uh, affect of their life of living, quality of life. Um, uh, look at back to the uh, epic art itself, we have a challenging uh, in terms of social business, but, uh, 
uh, pandemic campaign because we our budget based on uh, social business for uh, uh, sixty percent of our social business support to our organization. When a pandemic happening, um, our cafe is not really doing good. Our uh, encounter performer, we don't have any tool of performance and create themselves not that great sell. So that really uh, quite a stress out uh, this two years. And then um, the same with other uh, panelists here as well, that what we experienced. Um, uh, one also uh, uh, other thing that I want to highlight is the uh, uh, implement of the policy of people with disability in Cambodia is quite slow because uh, that affected all uh, different development area of uh, people with disability access society. Uh, the policy are in place, but the implementation is really slow. That's why um, that lack of a lot of things in terms of accessibility, education and information. Opportunities always we always like believing in positive and uh, the can do attitude. We always we hope that uh, Cambodia now open back again uh, in the country, and we hope the tourists coming back and uh, social business getting better. But also in the same time, while uh, post pandemic, we uh, reflected ourselves in terms of Ipic Cafe. We think about how can we uh, uh, fight back in this pandemic. So we are looking in the way that how can our food actually uh, not just based on uh, tourists, but also uh, provide the service for a, a local audience as well. So we hopefully that we starting practice one year early that will be built back with a good uh, a good term of in terms of the cafe. That opportunity we can see and we get more connected with our, uh, our local people, local business, and also the partners that will work together to promote their social business. And um, uh, very recently, the Cambodian government have announced the national uh, strategy plan 2019 and 2030, uh, 2023, sorry. Uh, that's uh, sound for me to very ensure that they've been thinking through all the process of the issue that people with disability face. And at the same time, they put some budget on that as well. One of the issue that there was a strategy plan that's no budget to do things. So that I think that really I hope that things could get better in 2023. And um, one of the ways I wish is that, uh, you know, as a social business, uh, at Cambodia, it's, a, it's quite new in terms of development. So new policy coming up quite a lot. And the moment very bang on in terms of tax, paying tax, uh, register business and stuff like that. So we have to pay tax quite heavily in terms of our income. So I, I just hope that any better policy that support social business, not so much taking tax, so allow those income to support directly to people uh, need them also that what I can kind of wishing list that hope that happens that from my side thank you Katie uh, thank you so much Sokni and yeah. Max you know last but not least if you could share your thoughts as well please yeah um so when uh, we initially founded steps the idea was to provide training um, model one inclusive business just one uh, which at the time was a cafe uh, and then help our graduates move on to our partner companies who, who we were supporting. Um, but our graduates didn't want to leave. So we had to rethink the, the model entirely. Um, and that's partly because um, the quota system in Thailand um, requires companies with 100 employees to hire one person with a disability. Uh, and our graduates are going back to us saying that they don't want to be the one in a hundred. They want to work for truly inclusive organizations, which is what we were modeling. So it then became our uh, challenge to, to solve this, this innovation as, as TJ put it. So the first thing we did was create a franchise model, which empowered um, some of our graduates' families to then go on and run franchises. Then we decided to open more cafes ourselves. Um, and then that led to different types of social inclusive businesses, um, including retail shops um, and business outsource services, um, because we felt quite passionately about not uh, pigeonholing our graduates into certain industries. They should have the opportunity to gain transferable skills and go on into any sector. Um, and by doing this, this actually helped us to, to reach where we are today. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's, it's always been um, critical to us that we are, 
we are modeling inclusive and sustainable business, but the more of those that we've done uh, and the longer that we've been doing it for and demonstrate that we make a profit, the more that the business case has been demonstrated and employers are much more open to work with us and hear about how that they could then go and champion this themselves because we're still here. Um, I sit in many meetings, especially in the last year where there's a look of surprise on uh, employment partners faces. Oh, you're still here and through a pandemic. Oh, and you're still sustainable and you're still inclusive. If you can do it, then we should be able to do it, which is exactly what we, we are trying to, to advocate for. Um, so I think, yes, uh, difficult times such as COVID do force us to, to rethink how we do it. Um, and the more that we, all of us, all the fantastic speakers that have shared today keep doing what we do, I, I hope that it encourages the wider society to, to embrace it also and do, and do it themselves. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I have a feeling that our participants are a bit in awe um, and I think they've, they've really been trying to absorb because no one has put in any questions. Um, but, you know, as, as a moderator, I feel my job is incomplete if I don't engage all of you for one more round. Um, I, I would like to probably just throw, throw this thought out to all our speakers today. Including, including Alison and Nicola. Um, and that would be, you know, for the aspiring um, social entrepreneurs, what would be that one message that you would give them to encourage them on this journey? So for the next generation, you know, because for many of you, you have been there, you are doing it, but for the next generation, what could be one message that you would want to leave with them to encourage them on this journey? Um, perhaps let me start with Alison. Sure. Um, what comes to mind for me was actually one of the more surprising remarks um, throughout our interviews with uh, with the social entrepreneurs on the call today, as well as a number of others. Um, so many of them are providing um, such impactful support to helping employers become inclusive um, and therefore addressing one of the greatest forms of discrimination still facing persons with disabilities throughout ASEAN today. And what I found so surprising was that a number of the social entrepreneurs said that so many of these companies are more ready than they realize to become fully inclusive. Um, that in fact, it's not so difficult to be a fully inclusive company. Um, and the small amount of differences that, that may need to be made are, are in fact very accessible and directly addressed by so many of these enterprises today. Um, so, so I suppose the, the message more crystallized would be that um, the, the change is very close in fact, um, and it's completely possible. Thank you very much, Alison. Nicola. Yeah, very briefly, uh, demonstrate your impact. I think that uh, today there's, a, there's plenty of capital, of resources, whether investment or philanthropic, that are ready to support young, uh, courageous entrepreneurs. Um, but they need to be able to provide evidence that what they do is impactful. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Max. Uh, I think don't be rigid in your, in your thinking. Um, we're talking about something that it's very difficult for anybody to position themselves as an expert on. I always sort of hate that, hate this term. Inclusion means different things to different people. Um, when we look at inclusion in the workplace, we're looking at it in different stages, right? It's stage one is to be able to access the job advert in the first place. That's the, you know, the main port of uh, failure on many is job adverts aren't uh, accessible themselves, the way they're written, the, the platforms they're posted on. Um, so when we're talking about this process of creating inclusive employment, it goes through many stages. Uh, and as Alison shared, and I'm sure the other um, 
panelists agree, it is a lot easier than people perceive it to be. Um, so keep pushing for it and demonstrating it. And as Nicola said, capture your impact because that's what they're looking for. They want to sh be able to see that it's been done and that they can easily do it too. Um, and then once you begin, continue working with them because it's not a, a finished case once somebody gets a job. You have to continue going into support because people's needs change and so do working environments, just as they do for you and I. Thank you very much. Um, Sokni? Yes, I really uh, echo all our panelists said. I believe this uh, uh, social inclusion and disability inclusion, it's have to work together. We can't work alone. If um, we work alone, we can't be rich or, or achievement what we've been uh, aimed for. So work together for us, not just for disability, but for us. That was in my statement, uh, believe that what we work here. So thank you. Thank you. And finally, Victoria. Um, I think uh, my one of my big takeaways is around learning and capturing learning. I think I've sort of found a lot of people are really, really interested in the things that haven't gone so great and, and how we've pivoted or changed as a result. Um, and so I suggest that there's, there's lots of support out there, like Nicola has said. Um, they're also interested in how, how we change and how quickly um, if something is not working. So that's probably my big takeaway. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all of you for sharing your thoughts. I know it's, it's been a very thought provoking. Um, I hesitate to use the word inspiring, but it has, you know. Um, and I think for our participants who are here this afternoon, if I may just add one thing, because our speakers have said, companies out there are actually more ready than we think they are. I would paraphrase it to say, you know, if social entrepreneurship is something you are interested in, don't sit on a chair and wait. Go out there, you know, be proactive, reach out to the companies, talk to them. Because if you don't, you never know. But if you reach out to them, who knows, right? that these companies are actually ready, ready to partner with you. Yeah. And if there are any corporates, businesses that are here joining us this afternoon, um, you know, as the moderator, I would say, come on board if you have not. The need is there. Um, I think the more people that we can bring on board in this journey, the better it is. And we can just do our part, you know, no matter how big and how small. I think every little part would count in this journey of bringing transformation, bringing dignity, bring about real, that independence and that sense of self-worth for them to be accepted for who they are. I want to thank all our speakers this afternoon because it has really been um, such a thought-provoking one. Um, I want to thank also our interpreters for this afternoon, you know, to both of you for doing such a great job. To, to be with us, to share with us, to interpret for us. Um, this brings us to the end of this special ESI session, uh, but it is not the end of the journey. You know, um, once the, this whole recording has been tidied up, we will be sharing this um, on the eReal website as well. So we do ask you to look forward to it. Um, it has been my personal pleasure to be the host of this event to MC it with all our fabulous speakers. And really on behalf of um, Iria, you know, we just want to thank you for joining us today. So um, thank you all. Thank you all our speakers, Alison, um, Nicola, to Max, Sokni, to Victoria, and even Seng Chun who's not with us. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you next year as we begin to embark on more things related to ESI and the different parts of this ecosystem. So have a good afternoon, good evening, and good night to wherever you are. Thank you and goodbye.